God bless you. You may be seated this morning. Ruth and I just came back from our celebration of our general council in Orlando, Florida. And when we go on these trips, many people think that we are on vacation and we're going to enjoy it and it's going to be great and see a lot of stuff and then come back home refreshed. Well, it isn't like that at all. Uh, we flew out Friday and we started business sessions at 7.30 that morning. We ended at 7.30 that night. That's, I think, 12 hours of sitting and listening and debating and talking and hearing reports and all that kind of stuff all day long. And it happened from Friday through Friday, more or less. We decided to leave Friday. We'd had enough. <laughs> and then uh, a lot of good things happen in between, of course. We do have services. Everybody, we have a service that starts in the morning. Somebody preaches, and then at night, great worship. Just uh, an incredible uh, moment in the presence of God during those interludes uh, beside, uh, as we put aside business. And every time that happens, I say, Lord, speak to me. I've come this far, Lord God, it's because of business, but also because obviously somebody's going to say something, and I want to make sure, Lord God, that I receive the word that you have for me this morning. And every time, it seems like, uh, without a doubt, that as uh, the preacher is preaching away, he's preaching at me. And everything he's saying, I receive it in the name of the Lord. And says, Lord, thank you for speaking to me today. And many times it's been exciting to be able to just enter into the presence of God with uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I think we had over 22,000 in attendance. Uh, worshiping Almighty God. The, the, many times the worship is outstanding. It's great. And it just ministers to you. One of the evenings, uh, the, the service just continued. And they, they invited everybody up to the altar to pray and to just be in the presence of God. We probably prayed for over an hour just praying in the presence of God. And you come back refreshed that way spiritually. In the body, you come back worn out. But we're glad we're back and uh, be able to continue doing the work that uh, God has called us to do. The church is still here, so that means that Pastor Danny and Pastor Marcus and Pastor Tommy must have done an all right job. So thank God that you guys are still here. Well, this morning I, I want to speak about uh, uh, an interesting little topic. We've been talking about methods of evangelism, but we've titled it Love God, Love People, and Love the City. Love God, Love the People, and Love the City. I remember that I wasn't a pastor yet of TC or any church. I've never pastored another church. And the Lord put in my heart the, the, the little slogan, ministering to the needs of people. And I wasn't a pastor yet. I didn't have any real idea that I would be a pastor. As a matter of fact, I thought I would never be a pastor. But that's the slogan that came to my mind And when I started pastoring. That's the slogan that we use for this church, ministering to the <clears throat> needs of people. And God has helped us to do it so many ways. Uh, you know, just uh, I, 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 I'm just blessed to see ministries continue to come out of TC to help the community, to help each other and even to reach the world, because not only do we minister to us here, we minister to the people in the city and through different ministries, but we also minister to people around the world through our missionary program. So thank God we're able to do all that. And, and I've always sought the mind of God to say, Lord, how do we do it? Teach me, Father, how do we do it? How do we, how do, we do a better job? But I never thought that really kind of uh, what God would want us to do is to go through some suffering, suffering and persecution to be able to do a better job of ministering to the world. As I look at the book of Acts, we've been kind of concentrating in the book of Acts, we see how this is really the picture. The church suffered a bunch to be able to carry out the will of God. We look at chapter 6 and chapter 7, talking about Stephen, talking about then the Apostle Paul or Saul of Tarsus, how Stephen had to suffer. The Bible says in uh, 7, 50, 54, when they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father or of God, and he said, look, he said, I set heaven open, and the Son, of, uh, uh, the Son of Man, I see, I'm sorry, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Of course, at this, they covered their ears and 
yelling at the top of their voices. They all uh, rushed at him. Look at this. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. I mean, these guys were, <laughs> they were mean. They were mean. And of course, uh, they, it says they took the clothes of Stephen and threw them at the feet of, of Paul, then Saul of Tarsus. And when they were uh, uh, stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord, Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold that sin against him. Of course, when he said, yes, he fell asleep or he died. And what, a, what a way to grow a church. A title that I have this morning is Church Persecuted, Church Scattered. I also thought of other uh, ways of addressing you and, and giving this sermon a, a topic. Scattered to grow. As a result of the persecution that came to the church, they were all scattered. And that's the way God decided so they could grow. Suffering to be purified. You know that the church persecuted is a church purified? If the church does not go through persecution, suffering, and all those things that we don't like to think about, apparently the church won't grow. It won't become the church that God wants it to be. Persecuted to progress. In other words, for, God, for that church to, grow, to progress and to be the church that God wanted it to be, he sent persecution. Persecution did not just appear. It was God's design. Is that God? Is that really God? Is that the way God does it? Is that one of the methods of evangelism? Well, goodness, if that is one of the methods of evangelism today, no wonder the church in America is not growing. We heard the statistics in Orlando this past week. I'll tell you what, we're in bad shape. The church in America is in bad shape, losing about 60,000 people a day. Church in America is not growing. Assemblies of God is growing because of the ethnic groups. We've got a bunch of ethnic groups that are part of this fellowship. And that's the only reason for, past, for the past 25 years that the Assemblies of God is growing. Thank God for us. Can somebody give the Lord a round of applause for us? Thank God that God has helped us to help the Assemblies of God. But is that the way the church grows? You know, it looks like if we're going to make a difference in the world, as a people of God, as men of God, we will suffer. If you're going to make a difference, you're going to suffer. You know, so many times we make the altar call, come and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and surrender your life to him as I'll do it later on. And he will be a blessing to you and you're going to be doing great. You know, you won't have to be concerned about a whole bunch of stuff because the Lord is going to be with you. Well, i tell you what, that's, mm, as I look for that message in, book, in the book of Acts, I don't find it too often. I don't find it. You know what? Welcome this morning to the people that are called to suffer, that will be persecuted. Jesus says in the world, you're going to be persecuted. And guess what? You're going to go through a lot of affliction, a lot of problems. We don't like that kind of language, but that, that's here. Church is going great. All of a sudden, the ladies got upset because they weren't getting enough food, etc. And then the Lord introduces Stephen to us. He was just a guy like you guys. He was not, had not gone to LABI or Vanguard University or any other seminary for that matter. He was just a guy full of the Holy Ghost. That's the difference. Full of the Holy Ghost. And the Lord used him to do mighty deeds and mighty wonders to exalt the name of the Lord and, of course, continue to grow the church. And I guess they were doing so well that God says, huh, I've got to shake them up a little bit. There's a scripture that I love in the last book of uh, chapter of Deuteronomy that says that the Lord loved his people as the apple of his eye. And then he says he started shaking up their nest. Turn it up. This church was having fun, everything was great, thousands coming. And then the Lord says, well, it's time, because I told him I want this gospel scattered throughout the world. So he sent persecution. And, uh, and I guess that's the way God operates, as I see it. Look at the apostle Paul. He was, you know, Saul of Tarsus was standing there, a, a Pharisee of Pharisees, probably the best educated, the most learned, very sharp man standing there. 
watching what they were doing to Stephen, I mean, they were stoning him to death. I, how would you want to, would you even want to stand there and look at that? But he's there, which means he was given his approval. He was willing. He was like the rest. Everything were, yeah, we're doing the right thing. Come on. And then he continued to persecute the church, and I'm going to put you in jail, and I'm going to kill you guys because you guys are going against our faith. We are, you know, solid Jewish people. You're supposed to believe like us. And, and this name, Jesus, it bothers me. You guys should not be talking about him. And so I'm here to approve of what's going on. Now, he didn't know that when they threw the clothes at his feet, he was the recipient now of what <laughs> was going on in the life of Stephen. It's like Jesus was saying, and he didn't know it at the time, you're next. You're next. You can, later on, you're going to talk about growing the church and doing all kinds of things. Well, see what's happening to Stephen. You're, you're, you're going to go through the same. Matter of fact, Paul gives us a whole list of things, man, of how he suffered for the cause of Christ. Is persecution the way to go? Is that the way God grows the church? I believe it's a biblical pattern. Every time the people in the Old Testament denied God and, and went with God, God had to once again send the enemy to kill them and destroy them and do all kinds of stuff to them so that they could wake up and start calling on God again. So we discovered that this is the way apparently we're... we're, we're, we're uh, Watching this thing develop and unfold before our very eyes, this is the way God does stuff. And I was just thinking about that as I was preparing this message, and I thought about Greg Laurie, a good friend, great preacher, one of the greatest evangelists. You know, he fills the Angel Stadium once a year. What happened to his son? Remember that? His son is driving up the 91 freeway in one morning, and, and he ran into the back end of a truck killed immediately. You know, I know that a lot of people in Southern California love Greg Glory. A lot of people have come to Christ as a result of his ministry. You know, he was a, he's a wonderful pastor to a lot of people. I can just imagine when they heard, they, they, they just started praying and saying, God, comfort and strengthen and be with the family, etc., as we did here this morning. But I'm sure a lot of them also said, Lord, God, why would you allow that to happen? I mean, we're not talking about just anybody. We're talking about Greg Glory, a great man of God, a guy that has touched the life of many people. Why would you let that happen? See, we don't like to suffer. We don't like to speak that language, a language that is foreign to us, especially when it comes to church and God. God is supposed to love us. You know, it was, it was old Job way back in the Old Testament that says, why should the righteous suffer? I think that's what we learned. We learned this language from Job. Job was a righteous man. He was a great man, the Bible says, and yet he has to suffer to the point that he was left with nothing. Even sick in body and his friends criticizing him. Like, Job, something must be wrong with you. And probably some people started saying, hey, maybe something's wrong with Greg. Maybe because of him, he must have, he must have a hidden sin. You know, there's, there's those brothers and sisters that, do that, that have that kind of language. They come and say, you know what, <clears throat> there's got to be something going on here because look what they're going through. <laughs> what about Rick Warren? Great pastor, by many called the best or the best known pastor in America. A man that has blessed pastors all over the world. All over the world. Yeah, every, you know where Rick goes and he's going to have a conference and and you're able to get in there, you want to be in there, because he's always got something to say. Something to say that is so important to you as a man of God that you can learn from it and you can bring it back to your church. Ruth and I were with him here a couple of years ago maybe, and uh, we just enjoyed hearing him. He always has something to say that's important. He had a son, as you guys know, he had suffered for years with mental problems. Emotional problems. They gave him this medicine and that medicine and this therapy and that therapy. He used to take him to preachers that pray for the sick and he tried everything. And it, it just, it never, it, he'd come back the same. Wow. A man of God, man. Why, why have a son that has those problems? Why should he? I remember that story according to his mother is that he called one morning and he says, I think today is the day. 
down. You and I, your son calling you in the morning, today's the day, you obviously ask, what? what? What about this day? She didn't have to ask. She knew basically what he was saying. And she starts calling everybody, pray for my son, and tells Rick, and let's pray, what do we do? And, and let's go to the Lord. I can just imagine this precious couple going to her knees and, and crying, Lord, please be with him now. Don't, don't, don't let the enemy take over here. Don't, don't, don't let him have to go through something like that that I think he's got in mind that he should not, should not do. Started calling finally. He didn't answer the phone. and lay, So they drove over to his apartment, knocked on the door. He would not open the door and nothing and called the cops and they came and opened the door and went in and sure enough, he had taken his life. Church persecuted, church scattered, church grown, growing, church purified, church progressing. Wow. Is that the way the Lord does it? I'll tell you what, yes, I, I've studied the life of so many that have suffered tremendously. I think about Gigi Avila, many of you don't even know who that is, but he was one of the greatest Hispanic evangelists from Puerto Rico. His daughter gets married to a man and one year he decided she didn't, she didn't love her anymore and killed her, stabbed her 37, 38 times. Gigi Avila made a trip to Florida to see the man in prison and just to tell him, I forgive you. Well, think about all these guys. They continued to minister. In spite of what they've gone through, Rick and Greg and Everybody else, the great Oral Roberts, his son, com son commits suicide, you know, all, all over the place. One, one thing that I remember that Rick said that just blew me away is the year 2013 was our worst year, but it was our greatest year. Worst year because my son committed suicide. Didn't go to church for six months. I remember receiving an invitation to be there on the day that he was going to start ministering. And of all Saturdays, I was busy. Just to support him, just to be with him. But he says it was the greatest year. Because I saw people come around me and my wife and love us, and hug us, and kiss us, encourage us, support us. The greatest year of my life. Kind of doesn't make sense. But tell you what, this is the way. These great men and women of God just received the message, yeah, God, it's been the most awful day in my life, but I, I, I don't turn you loose. I don't turn you loose. I hold on. Lord, I don't understand it. But we're going to make it. We're going to make it. Can you imagine this, this man, Stephen, a great man of God, mightily used of God. I mean, stone after stone. How could they do that? And finally, he's dead. Guess what? I can just imagine the burial and saying, you know what? It's over. This, this is absolutely ridiculous, man. We don't have to go through this kind of stuff. Next time it's going to be you. Next time it's going to be me. What? You know, no. You know what? The Bible says the church scattered. <laughs> that wherever they went, they cease not to speak about Christ and Him crucified. The Bible says that they filled the city with the name of Jesus. First Christian martyr. I, I just like, maybe the Lord has a sense of humor. But I don't know, it didn't come out too good as far as I'm concerned. When, when he talked to Ananias and says, you know, Saul of Tarsus is going to be, he's going to come to you. And I want you to do something. I want you to minister to him. I want, to, I want you to open his eyes because he's blind. And I want you to help him. I want you to disciple him. He's my servant. But Lord, not Saul of Tarsus. Yeah, that's the guy I'm talking about. Lord, he's a great persecutor. He's a guy that kills people and puts people in prison and hates Christians. Well, don't worry. Uh, I'm sending him. You're, you're going to minister to him and you're going to open his eyes. And, but, but, but tell him, tell him, tell him that I'm going to use him mightily. But it's going to cost him a bunch. 
Have you ever heard God tell you that? Have you even considered that you would suffer for Christ? You know, the church in the East, all the church in the Middle East and Asia and all that area, they suffer for Christ to this day. This morning I opened the newspaper and sure enough there was a heading there. Christians from Syria are fleeing by the thousands. Christians are fleeing by the thousands because they're afraid they're going to be killed. Because they're Christians. Because they're Christians. Just a few weeks ago, you know, they killed a bunch of them. They're in Egypt because they're Christians. I remember this magazine that we had here in the entrance to our offices. And there was a picture of a lady, a young lady. And uh, she was in prison. And of course, they were asking us to pray for her. So I read the article. And then it says, in the article, she says, she says, don't pray for me to be released from prison. Pray for me to have the strength to be in here and to learn the sufferings of Jesus. That's the kind of stuff we don't understand anything about. I, I have people that come to Pastor, Pastor, my son's in jail. Uh, pray for him. Do you have a lawyer? Do you know somebody? Pray for him. I've got to pull him out. He's a good boy. Oh, yeah, he's in jail because he's a good boy. Many times I feel I tell him, he's in there because he deserves it. Leave him alone. He's in a good place. No, I've said that more than once. I have said that more than once. I told the sister or the brother, leave him there. That's the best place for him. We don't want to suffer. We don't want anything to hurt us. No, uh, I want to feel good. I'm, I'm a child of God. I should be rejoicing. I should have everything I need. My God, you know, I should be blessed. Take me to that preacher that blesses people. Let him give me a word that he'll bless me and say, you know what, you're going to get a million dollars. All your kids are going to be great. Your family is going to be ex uh, outstanding. You're going to be the best example for everybody. Uh, that's what I want to hear. Bless me, Jesus. Bless me, Jesus. Don't tell me I'm going to be persecuted. Don't tell me I'm going to suffer. That's not the kind of stuff I want to hear. The church in the East, they suffer. And they suffer a bunch for the cause of Jesus Christ. But the church in the West, very. You know that <laughs> we often have activities here, obviously. We have all kinds of stuff. We have prayer once a month, together, first Monday of the month. I'm not going to say how many came this past Monday. I don't even have to ask. But we are very fortunate if a few come. And we've been looking at the English service people. We often say, what happened to the English service? We announce prayer. We announce BBS. And the first thing we do is pick up the phone. Let me check. You know, I want to make sure how well my week is going to go. Oh, my God. I'm swimming every night. Oh, they also have uh, soccer, kids. And uh, man, I, my night, I have to go get my toenails cut. And I don't know that I can make it. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. So a lot of Christians in the Western church changing their schedule for God is suffering. That's suffering. I, I'm being persecuted. Pastor wants me to come and I don't have the time. Something isn't right. It can't be that way. I, I, I've, got my, I've got my interests. Oh, I know you have your interests, but what about God's interests? Who's number one here? Is it you or is it God? Really, really, is it you or is it God? I believe that if it's God, things are going to change a lot in your calendar. And isn't it true when we look at the calendar? So who's number one, the calendar or God? 
you know, I'm too busy to bring my kids to VBS. Listen to me. Listen to me. I've been around a long time. But there's days. You're going to be crying your eyeballs out because your kids are all messed up. So you don't want to suffer. You don't want to be persecuted in your language. You don't want to go through that kind of stuff. You just want to have life and enjoy it and everything be fine. Don't bother me too much. Leave me alone. I'm doing great. I go to, I go to church on Sunday morning, pastor, for an hour and a half. And, and guess what? I, I, I'm feeling great. Yeah, the reason you feel great is because you released a little bit of the guilt by coming to church on Sunday morning. And I, and I did what, what is expected of me. Just wondering, is that enough? that enough? Well, when I was a kid, that every time the doors opened in that church, I was there. Not because I wanted to. I was just like the kids today. I was just like you guys. <laughs> no, I didn't want to go to church. And they had Bible study for women. Oh, my God, boring. Let's all get out. Then they had prayer night. Oh, my Lord, a bunch of viejitos praying. I'll tell you what, right now, in parenthesis, thank God for those viejitos that pray. I think that's why I'm here. Without a doubt, I believe that I'm here because they prayed. Those viejitas, I remember Sister Diaz. Tiny little lady, she kneeled to pray. Let's go. But she was praying for Daniel. And Daniel is here tonight, this morning, because of Hermana Diaz. I think we need to change the calendar. I think we need to say, this week, tell you what, my kids are going to go to VBS. No swimming. No soccer, no football. Tell the coach, you should have told him two, three weeks ago, there is a week in the schedule, by the way, where my son and my daughter are not going to be here. You should have told that to your coach two or three weeks ago, four weeks. He might have told you, well, I'll tell you what, then they're not going to be part of the team. We'll tell them, I'm sorry. But they had to go to VBS. I can remind you, people, live your life by priorities. God must be number one. God at the top. Everything else follows. He's got to be number one at the top. You have an opportunity today for 18 years of bringing your children to church and teaching them about the ways of God and, and doing everything you can to make sure that they continue to serve God. One of these days, it won't be long, 18 years, just fly away. Guess what? They're going to tell you one of these days, junior high, high school, I don't want to go to church anymore. They will say that. I hope you say what my daddy said. As long as you're underneath my roof, you're going to go to church. Oh, my God, because it's going to be bad. It's going to be pretty bad. Live your life by priorities. They fill the city with the name of Jesus. They cease not to preach Christ. I think we have forgotten the condition of the soul. It comes down to that. I think we have forgotten the condition of the soul. We have forgotten that the soul is lost. Your kids are lost unless they come to Jesus. They're lost. And if they're lost, they're condemned. They're condemned eternally. They will not be in heaven with you. You will not have the joy and the blessing of being able to receive them when they enter the pearly gates. No, you will not because they will not serve Jesus. And the only way to heaven is by receiving him as Lord and Savior and by following him. Didn't Jesus say, if you're going to be my follower, you're going to have to pick up your cross, not put on your crown, not enjoy the blessings, not feel great because you've got salvation. If you're going to follow me, you're going to have to pick up your cross daily. Hey, that's persecution. That's suffering. That's what we don't like to hear. Then you can be my disciple. Wow. 
then you can be a disciple. In other words, what I'm preaching about is simply this. A cross before the crown. A cross before the crown. The crown doesn't come first. The cross comes first. So I'm inviting you this morning become a part of the company of the persecuted. Part of the company of those that will suffer. Will go through tribulation. Would you bow your heads in an attitude of prayer? Oh, thank you, Jesus, for speaking to us. Thank you for Stephen and thank you for Paul. Thank you for these great men of God. Thank you for the testimony, Lord, that they have left for us as they continue to serve God in spite of circumstances. I want to invite you to receive Christ. I want to invite you to this morning say, Lord, okay, here it is. It is what it is. I know who I am, Lord, and messed up and all that kind of stuff. But, Lord, I do want to give my life to you. I do want to serve you. Maybe... You're going to do this for the first time because you've never received Christ. You've never given your life to him. Or maybe it's, you know, you gave your life to him, but all kinds of stuff has gotten in the way. You know, things that you've criticized, things that you don't like, things that are not going the way you think they should. You know, you've developed this kind of an attitude, this kind of a spirit of being judgmental. And you find yourself today being more like the world than like him. You don't want to suffer. You need to come back. Thank God there's a scripture that says that God loves a backslider. There's a scripture that God says that he loves a backslider. You know what? He knew we were going to be a bunch of backsliders here and there. But he loves you. He loves me. He loves us with everlasting love. You say, Pastor, I don't understand everything, but I tell you what, I do understand that he loves me and that he cares about me and that I should surrender my life to him. And if you have not, would you raise your hand and let, let me pray for you? That's all you have to do. Let me see your hand. Let me take you before the Lord in prayer and ask God to come into your life if you haven't done that and just get rid of all the sin in your life and give you Life and life everlasting. That's what he promises. So if you want me to pray for you, please raise your hand and let me say, God bless you. Somebody else? Yes, God bless you. Somebody else? I just want to pray for you. Ask the Lord to come into your life. Yes, God bless you. Maybe you'll raise your hand now and say, you know what, Pastor? Man. You spoke to me today. Got it. Thank you, God bless you. I received this message. It spoke to me. I've been kind of serving the Lord. Yes and no. Yes and no. But I, I think I need to get back. God, I need to come back. Would you raise your hand? a little tough one because you consider yourself a Christian but uh, things are just not the way they should be those of you that raise your hand would you pay, put your hand over your heart right where you're seated and repeat these words after me you don't have to say them out loud but do say them in your heart say Lord Jesus thank you for speaking to me thank you for reminding me there is a cost when it comes to following you. Thank you for reminding me that if I'm to grow, I'm going to be persecuted. If I'm going to be purified, it's going to cost me something. Thank you for reminding me 
that I will never, never find myself alone. You'll be with me. I receive you as my Savior. I surrender all that I am to you. I'm asking that you become the Lord of my life. Take over. Take over. Show me the way, your ways, that I may walk therein. I confess with all of my heart that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I thank you for loving me as I love you. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. God loves you guys. This is your pastor preaching to you. What I consider the most important message of the day because it comes from the Word of God. Because God set the examples for you. God continue to work in your life. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's honor the Lord this morning.